started and then uh, turn it over to our presenters. So thank you guys. All right, thanks everyone for joining uh, for our session on modeling student success based on digital activity. I think we'll just get started with a few introductions. Um, so my name is Kyle Unruh. I'm the Data Solutions Architect at Unison. Um, and I'm joined by both Sarah Bolf and Ross Miller, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Sarah, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Sarah Bolf. I am the Data Analyst at Unison. And my name is Ross Miller. I'm a Senior Application Developer at the University of Iowa. Great. Uh, let's see. So I think I will do the introduction just to set up the project a little bit. Um, so, um, this project was kind of born out of a hackathon that was hosted by Unison um, in terms of um, gathering some new data and putting it together and then seeing what we could do with some of the Google tools, but then also doing a little bit of a review in terms of what we could do with data in order to support students. So Kyle, do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, sure. So um, in looking at current solutions on campus, we have um, very few data-driven tools to identify students that are struggling. Um, we do have a learning analytics solution that's called Elements of Success. Um, it's, it's very specific for students and faculty, and it also is best for courses that have a lot of formative assessments. So think lots of assignments, quizzes, that kind of thing. Um, and then in terms of solutions for advisors, um, there are some manual interventions that happen by a manual intervention team on campus. Um, we have some retention modeling, but that's really more for projections. Um, we have a first year survey, like most other schools, that um, is helpful in identifying some students that might leave the university. Um, and then um, in cooperation with Google, there was a GPA model that was based on um, the Unison data platform. And um, Kyle is going to talk a little bit more about the Unison data platform as we go through our presentation. Next slide. Um, so uh, our proposed solution. Uh, through there. The uh, text isn't showing up. Let's see. Let me try to present one more time from here. Okay. So we were looking at a tool that was going to assist advisors and student success teams to figure out um, what kind of uh, those to figure out which students were struggling before midterm grading. You know, after midterm grading, we kind of have a pretty good idea of who's going to be successful and who isn't, but that's not necessarily helpful if we think students could still improve their grades or maybe still um, retain through the semester. So we're looking at those kind of early measures to do early intervention. That's a, you know, a hot term in learning analytics. Um, and then we wanted to use an um, AI or statistical approach to model student success. So we didn't want to just, you know, pick things that we thought were applicable to student success. We wanted to actually test those out. And so um, we were able to build a machine learning model based on top of the Unison data platform, um, and we use Google Cloud to accomplish that and do some of our machine learning um, machine learning steps. Next. Um, and so then our modeling goal was to take um, students' digital activity, so using Caliper events, and then looking, comparing their activity and performance with their peers in the same course. Um, and then we combine that along with some information about what kind of course they were in, um, but we did not use historical measures. So things like um, their GPA, their university GPA or um, prior learning achievements like um, ACT scores, SAT scores, things like that. Um, we just were comparing like a kind of a blank slate at the beginning of the semester is kind of what we talk about as a starting point for our model. Yep, and then trying to predict if the student will pass the course or not. Is our measure. I think uh, I'll turn it over to Sarah there. Uh, no, I'm going to do the, I'll do the tool, okay. tools and data. Um, so before we dive into the actual model performance, which is what Sarah's going to cover, um, uh, I want to give a little bit of an overview of kind of Unison's role um, and kind of how we, how we actually built the solution and why we made some of the decisions that we did for, for some of the tools. Um, so I guess before we go into that, uh, for anyone that may not know uh, about Unison or may not be as familiar with Unison, we are a nonprofit consortium of universities. We provide tools, data, and services um, to our member institutions to model learners, learning environments, and learning processes. Um, so the Unison data platform that Ross mentioned before was one of the three main components that we used. So the University of Iowa has a Unison data platform that we provide to them. Um, it really is all of University of Iowa's data, 
um, but we build the units and data platform around standards, the units and common data model, and the IMS global caliper standard. Um, those are the two, two standards that fuel the units and data platform. And we take uh, data from many different source systems, the LMS, mostly Canvas, um, SIS systems, and any number of teaching and learning tool that uses IMS Global Caliper. We aggregate and standardize that data in one place on Google Cloud. So this act, acts as an entry point um, for types of analyses and projects like the digital learning scorecard, which is what we're talking about today. Um, the second tool we used, uh, it was Google BigQuery. Um, so the units and data platform consists of 74 or 75 different tables, plus a giant table that has all of the students' behavior, which we call the event store. So all the LTI launches and clicks exist in the event store. Um, and other learning environments, learning processes are modeled in the context store on the UDP, which creates a, a relational database of about 74, 75 tables. Um, to do our feature engineering and our target engineering for this modeling project, we used, utilized Google BigQuery. So we wrote a lot of, um, a lot of SQL queries <laughs> and stored tables along the way to really model the in-term behavior that Ross mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so we stored this in Google BigQuery built on top of the units and data platform. Um, and this was kind of a natural choice for us tool-wise, just because the units and data platform was already on Google Cloud. Um, and we needed some quick performance on terabyte scale data. Um, whenever we're tracking the IMS Global Caliper events, it's kind of like a fire hose. And so it's not uncommon for gigabytes of data to exist every day um, as we're appending new events um, into a, a, a school's UDP. So we needed something that was able to be cloud-based and be able to handle large data sets very quickly. And that was Google BigQuery. And then in terms of doing the actual predictions and the modeling, we used Google AutoML, which is Google's uh, managed deep learning uh, service for structured data um, to do supervised learning. So um, kind of our, our target variable was whether or not the student uh, passed the course using um, you know, previous term enrollments and, and previous term data. And then our features were those in-term behavior features that um, Sarah's gonna go into, into uh, later. But this was a supervised learning problem. It integrated directly with BigQuery because it's still built on Google Cloud. Um, and it, it was really a good solution because it was able to scale the computing resources to fit the problem. So as new terms of data come in for University of Iowa, the data set grows and AutoML is ready to, um, ready to accept that new data. So these are the three main components that we used. Um, and I want to speak a little bit more about why we chose AutoML specifically. Um, other predictive analytics projects could use um, libraries like TensorFlow, could use an R-based um, implementation. But we chose AutoML for a few reasons. One was around model selection, or, or perhaps uh, an abstracted away model selection. So instead of hand training an on, or, or choosing an ensemble model and trying to pick, pick which type of machine learning uh, model would work best for this data, we, use, we just leveraged AutoML to um, try as much as it could to do a deep learning approach to, to, uh, to fit a model based on our data. So that allowed us to focus on more on the data and optimizing our parameters and our features instead of spending as many cycles hand training a specific model using specific algorithm or technique. Um, another benefit of AutoML was the approachability. So um, a practitioner with no prior AutoML experience or any ML experience necessarily um, could get up and running as long as they're comfortable working with uh, relational databases or tables. So we found this to be kind of a sweet spot with uh, a lot of the skill sets that we were working with across university stakeholders. Um, not everyone has a data science background. Um, so something like AutoML is something that allows people to kind of get up and running more quickly. Um, operationalizing the results is, is pretty easy with AutoML. Once you have a model that's trained, you can take new data that exists in BigQuery that the model hasn't seen and pass that data through the model that's already trained, utilizing the Google Cloud tools where the data already lives. Um, so there are live and batch predictions. So you could take a bunch of data and do a prediction all at once with that data, or as new rows stream into whatever data source you have, AutoML can pick that up and then generate predictions on the fly as it sees new data. Um, so it's having both of those two options with AutoML uh, made it seem like a pretty flexible tool that could fit with any university workflow, depending on which group you're, you're working with. Um, and then again, scalability. Uh, so the idea here is that we wrote, uh, we wrote the code on the Unison Data Platform. So any school that has Unison Data Platform implementation on Google Cloud could take the same exact process um, that we went to do this for Iowa and do it for their school's data. 
Um, so the idea here is it's not just a, a one and done application that we want this to be something that could be um, knowledgeable and useful for, for other schools that might, might be um, interested in a, in a similar solution. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah and she'll talk about the, our model features and how our model performs. Okay, so now I'll discuss the model features. Um, so all our features we included in our model were interim features, since we wanted to focus on using current term behaviors to predict results rather than past term behaviors. A large portion of these features were temporal, capturing student activity up to a certain week in a term. Um, in using these features, we hope to be able to capture student activity up to a certain week in a term without taking into account historical data such as cumulative. Our model was trained on pre-spring 2021 data and tested on spring 2021 data. So the features we included in our model can be further split into two types, learning context features and student activity features. Learning context features give information about the external learning environment of a student. The learning context features in our model describe the academic term and the course that a student was enrolled in. Student activity features, on the other hand, told us about the behavior of a student in a course. Um, a lot of our student activity features were temporal, capturing student activity up to the sixth week of the course. This suit, our student activity features included the number of LTI launches, the number of submissions, the number of Canvas view days, the minutes spent in Canvas, the average learning activity score, and the number of discussion entries. Our course, which denoted whether a student passed or failed their course. Since our target feature was binary, we used a binary classification model. Um, so after we ran our model using AutoML, we um, tested how well it performed on our spring 2021 test data. So, so our model predicted that around 89% of the students would pass their course and around 11% would fail their course. The confusion matrix tells us how accurate these predictions are by comparing the predicted results to the actual results. Around 77% of actual failures were predicted correctly by our model, and around 23% were predicted incorrectly. Around 90% of actual passes were predicted correctly, and around 10% were predicted incorrectly. We also looked at the overall accuracy of our model, which was around 89%. However, since we had imbalanced classes, this measure is not as telling as the, as the confusion matrix is. The precision of our model or the percentage of predicted failures that were correct was around 48%. Our recall was around 77%. And as you may have noticed, this recall is the same um, value as was shown in the confusion matrix. And again, is the percentage of actual failures that were predicted correctly by our model. The final metric we looked at was the F1 score. Um, which captures both precision and recall. Our F1 score was around 0.59. We, um, based on all these metrics, we can conclude that our model performed well, um, especially when predicting passes. However, since a uh, main purpose of our model was being able to predict failures, we will want to further improve um, our F1 precision and recall scores in future trials. Specifically, our precision is relatively low and could cause us to waste resources on students who are predicted to fail by our model, but are not actually at risk. Um, our recall grade would also ideally be improved as we want to be able to help as many at-risk students as possible. Next slide. Um, so we also looked into how individual features performed and how much they contributed to our model. So this bar chart shows the um, relative importance of features in our model. The most important feature was course subject, followed by the number of view days in the first week and the average learning activity score as of the sixth week. With regards to learning context features, 
we found that the course would mattered more than the academic term. This is not that surprising since it makes sense that the level and subject of a course um, influences one's grades more than the year or semester. For student activity features, um, we found that behavior um, is a more significant indicator of performance than results. Although, although the learning activity score is important, it does not seem to be as important as the amount of time a student spends in Canvas. This may, this may suggest that when working with students, we should emphasize um, improving student engagement rather than solely focusing on their grades. Next slide, please. Um, this bar chart further illustrates the performance of individual features in our model by comparing um, the contributions of our student activity features and our learning context features. Student activity features contributed to around 79% of our model's predictions, while learning context features contributed to around 21%. While this is obviously in part due to just simply having more student activity features in our model, it also emphasizes that student activities and behaviors are stronger indicators of performance than external factors are. So now I'll go back to um, Ross for the next part. Okay, so then I would like to talk just a little bit about how we could see this maybe being used on campus. And while we're, we're not quite there yet, we've been having some initial conversations with advising groups here at Iowa about how they might deploy this to actually help students. Um, so I think the first thing that we were looking at is how do we actually find students that are struggling? Um, and right now at the University of Iowa, it's a little bit of like a Knights of a Roundtable approach in terms of people actually sit down at a table and discuss students that might be at risk and they get that information from instructors, other students, or sometimes even parents of students that let these let this group know about who might need um, to be spoken with or met with to, help, to see how they can improve. But we could see the digital learning scorecard as being an option for a way that we could actually pick out these students. So um, if you could see here, there's the risk a risk level high of the student with the all nines Canvas user ID. And that would be a student that we might be able to examine. Um, this helps advisors or student success teams actually pick out those individual people and, and figure out who needs to be spoken with. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, when you're actually having a conversation with those students, we can dig in and actually see where a student might not be matching up with their peers. So um, on a lot of the measures here, they're kind of on pace, but you can see in terms of Canvas view days or their learning or assessment scores in the lower left-hand corner and finally submissions in the lower right-hand corner that they're a little bit below their peers. And that would be a risk indicator for us. And that's where we could, uh, we could have advisors have a targeted conversation with a student about how they might improve their performance or how they need to talk to their instructor about how they could improve their performance. Um, so future possibilities with our project is um, we want to focus on how we can improve our model. So um, like Sarah talked about, we still have a fair number of mislabels. And while we'll never probably get to 100% because there's a lot of factors that we can't control, um, we do want to keep working on the features that we have, making sure that they're explainable. We've been experimenting with a new feature to kind of take out course subject um, so that it's a little bit easier to understand that we find that like course a course difficulty measure is almost equally explainable in our model to say that this course is historically very difficult and that might help people have more targeted conversations. Um, we've been adding a 10 week model as well. Um, that way we have um, different increments that um, advisors or student success individuals could use. Um, and then really we're looking at mislabels. So students that we um, don't have the right prediction for to make sure that we're um, to try to identify the gaps in our model and where what we need to add or remove in order to, to kind of fill those gaps. Finally, there's some other things that we can do to help improve, which is just gathering more data. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, not all of our vendors are have embraced Caliper yet, um, but as more and more vendors do, um, and we're working through the Unison Consortium to do this, um, adding more Caliper events from um, external learning tools is really helpful. Um, we have a couple right now, but having more is even more helpful. Um, and then also combining with other models just to um, know when to do interventions. So combining with models that do include 
um, prior learning ability might um, help advisors actually pick out who they need to be speaking with and who they don't. Um, and I think with that, we'll open it up to any questions you might have. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'll pause in case anyone in the audience has questions they want to ask. Um, if you want to, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can actually ask them verbally or feel free to use the chat to do that. While we're waiting, what would be your recommendations or suggestions for someone who's just starting down this path? Um, do you have any lessons learned you would share outside of what you've shared already? Cool. <laughs> I, mean, I think probably our biggest lesson learned is that um, this isn't like a, a normalized data set. So if you look at that, you know, most students in our courses pass the course. And I think that's something that Kyle and I really struggled with um, off the bat um, is yeah. equally weighting passing, passing and failing students. So um, because it'll never be an even distribution and machine learning models really like that even distribution. So we had to heavily penalize for the student, you know, for not predicting a not pass correctly. Um, okay. That was maybe our maybe our biggest lesson learned early on in the process. Yeah, I, I think one of my other uh, takeaways from from kind of where, where we are now and where where we started um, is kind of the the social nature of predictions within a university and, and this isn't necessarily even how the model is built but kind of how the model is used and operationalized can be very sensitive um so when going down this path like i would recommend uh exploring modeling and exploring predictions but even like the the dashboard that that ross showed didn't show any of those prediction scores necessarily in that first view um, to kind of start with modeling features and, and kind of comparing those features against course performance is kind of a, a, a more digestible way to start than, than showing predictions from a black box model. Um, so one of the things that I would emphasize if anyone wants to go down this path is really focus on explainability. Make sure that all stakeholders can trust the model and feel like they know what the model is doing. Um, especially, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of um, conversation now about bias within modeling, especially within learning analytics for underrepresented groups of students. And so anything that feels kind of hand wavy or black box can kind of be, um, can detract from the, the, the potential of this type of work. Um, so explainability, transparency is really key. That's great. Anyone else? It looks like um, just a, a kudos in the chat so far. All right, and at this point, thank you very much. Um, your emails are there, so if others have questions later on, they can always follow up with you. So thank you very much for sharing your story today. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate having the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.